in India, there were a lot of MFIs which was focused on the rural poor. And the rural poor obviously is the largest segment of the Indian poor. But there is a very large segment of population who are the urban poor and semi-urban, uh, constituting about 100 million people. And it's one of the fastest growing population. And most of our, even our uh, poverty alleviation programs which the government has or the NGO has, forget the microfinance institutions, are all focused on the rural. So we decided to focus on the urban poor in India, you know, and we are sort of the pioneers to work with the urban poor in a large scale. There have been others in a smaller scale who have done it, but not in the large scale like we have. Today we have 350 branches right across India, uh, though we don't operate in Andhra Pradesh, you know. Uh, we operate in 20 states and uh, we have close to a million customers. In 2007, after completing our pilot, we did our expansion plan and even though Andhra is right next door to us, we decided to skip Andhra Pradesh for two reasons. One is we didn't see any reason why we should be the fourth or fifth MFI operating in any particular area, you know. It didn't make business sense to us. Secondly, when you're working with the poor, one thing we realize is we cannot have an antagonistic relationship with the state government or any state. We may like them, we may dislike them, we can do whatever we want, you know. But end of the day, we cannot have an antagonistic relationship. And we saw in Andhra, that there was a very serious antagonistic relationship between the microfinance institutions and the state government. And the problem was on both sides. It is not just one-sided. At the core has been very aggressive growth. So they forgot their mission. Three or four MFIs went right helter-skelter, you know, growth at an enormous pace, uncontrolled pace, you know which destabilizes the entire industry. Their main goals was outreach, how fast could they get, how many customers, what kind of loan outstanding. The whole process of microfinance, which is sort of a, a process where you induct the customer, educate the customer into financial, you know, in financial literacy in terms of, and then give them loans, etc., which is a sort of gradual process got derailed, you know, and everyone went helter-skelter for this huge growth. And then finally, when the IPO happened, it was like the last uh, sort of straw, you know, and tied to it, there were a lot of governance issues which came out. When you have an IPO, you are on the spotlight, right? You can't have a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of dark, shadows around you, you know. And unfortunately with the SKS IP, a lot of governance issues which came out, which actually detracted from uh, the whole image of microfinance. Every industry goes through this kind of a thing, you know. And uh, I think there are a number of players who will either disappear or will have a very short haircut, okay. So there will be a lot of cleansing in the industry, I think, which is very good, you know. Uh, and I think everyone will have learned lessons. And if you don't learn how to operate in this segment, you know, you are not going to survive. Terrible consequences. The money lenders have already increased their rates. Regardless of what the state government says, they cannot service the entire credit needs of these customers, you know. And that's a very valuable gap which was being filled by microfinance institutions. So then what do they have to do? They fall back on the money lenders or they fall back uh, on sitting and doing nothing. In the last year, year and a half, we've had very high inflation in India, especially food inflation, you know. And what does the, uh, the food inflation impacts the poor, okay? Most, they are the most vulnerable. Secondly, we are having all this turmoil in the Middle East, okay? So obviously oil prices have shot up. The kind of shock which that sends to an economy like India is enormous. And again, it has 
an impact on our inflationary pressure, you know. And those kinds of pressures make India very vulnerable, you know. And microfinance, to that extent, was providing a shock absorber to the poor, okay. And unfortunately, in states like Andhra, where it's being removed, the poor will not have, uh, you know, that shock, shock absorber. And there will be serious political and social repercussions of this uh, in, the, you know, in, in the near future, you know, whether uh, it comes in an election or uh, whatever it is, you know. And, you know, I mean, in the extreme cases in India, uh, we have a Maoist insurgency going through, right through the country, you know, among the poorest people we have, are, which, who are the tribals, you know. It can easily expand into that, you know. And I think the government and uh, politicians and the administrators and even our Reserve Bank, you know, have to be conscious of that because that's the risk we are taking. In Andhra Pradesh, which has the longest history of microfinance in India, has the biggest customer base. For six months, there has been no microcredit. They've all disappeared, right? And here we were saying that, you know, we are doing such a grand work for the poor, right? Yet none of them have actually come, got up and said, hey, you know, what are you doing? Where have these people, good people disappeared, you know? Nobody is saying that. So obviously, what does it mean? It means that the microfinance institutions had lost their customer and community connect, okay? And which is extremely important when you're dealing with the poor, you know? There are different types of customer connect, you know? If you are a very wealthy person and I'm providing you uh, private banking services, I would maybe take you to a dinner or I take you to uh, you know, see a play or a musical. Those are different ways of community connect. Uh, customer connect, you know, with the poor, you have to work uh, with them, you know, uh, whether uh, if they have an emergency, you know, I mean, poor are constantly uh, having some kind of devastation, you know, fire, flood, this, that, you know. So you have to be there, help them in those kinds of situations, you know. You have to help them in, uh, microfinance is only one aspect, you know. Uh, whether it's in healthcare, vocational training, all these other things, you know, you have to give them a lending hand, you know. So, if, if that is not there, you know, you lose the connect with them. We started a program here, you know, last year we made, uh, first year we made profit after four years. And our board decided that they'll allocate a certain percentage of our profit to a social development activity to be undertaken in, at each branch. This is over and above whatever we do, healthcare, we do health camps in every branch through our foundation, you know, we do educational loan refunds, all kinds of vocational training. But this is specifically, we undertook a social development activity where we said customer center leaders and the branch staff will jointly decide what is the key, some kind of social development program for that area, you know, they're free to decide what they want and use the money for that project, you know, or projects. We started doing that from last year, I mean, beginning of last year, well before the crisis, you know, and it had, you know, it cost us hardly anything, you know. Uh, for each branch, we were allocated maybe $600, right? But that $600, which is undertaken by the customers and the staff, has had a enormous impact. I think one of the big lessons of this uh, microfinance crisis which we have in India today is frankly we have to get out of that original classic joint liability system which Grameen Bank and others in Bangladesh gave up in 2001, right? And I think it's the only place in the world where we still follow this joint liability system because even Latin America, they have individual lending, you know, and there's no group lending as such, you know. So that is one. The other thing, definitely, when we talk about microfinance, you're talking about savings, you know. And savings is an enormous need for the customer. Unfortunately, because of regulatory reasons, we are not allowed to offer savings.
IPO itself is not bad at all. You know, I went to the US and someone said, oh, I read on your website that you want to do an IPO. And immediately I said, yes. And immediately that sort of person shrunk, you know, in revulsion kind of thing. The reality is IPO gives us access to larger capital. And it allows us to diversify our ownership of our company, you know. Today, I am reliant on a few investors, large investors, you know, uh, who can really call the shots if they want to, you know. They know that, okay, you know, Shamit is there and he'll do the best for the company, so they don't uh, interfere that much on a day-to-day -day basis. But they could really, because they are the owners of the company. I own, what, 2.5% of the company only, you know. But the idea of an IPO is to go for a larger pool of capital and diversify our ownership. And that's our dream. We'll diversify our ownership, our management will be professional, professionally managed, you know, and the mission vision will remain intact. Micro credit was oversold as if it was a silver bullet for poverty elevation. Microfinance is one key, in, you know, uh, area which helps people to get out of poverty, but not the only one you need other interventions, you know. Our urban customers, when we first started, you know, and the whole microcredit, the definition of microcredit, small loans for little enterprise, so you get a higher income, etc., etc., and slowly climb out of poverty, right? What our urban customers told us is, very frankly, the loans you give us, first of all, we use it to repay high cost debt, okay, reduce this thing. Second, okay, you give us the second loan I will use for my enterprise and earn a little bit more, right? But frankly, that will not remove me from poverty, right? The only thing which will remove me from poverty is the children, my ed education of my children. So they were actually borrowing here loans at 5 to 10% a month to send children to private school. Okay, so you can imagine the cost they are ready to bear because they say that's the only way if my future generation can be educated, get a better job or do better business, that's the only way I'll get out of poverty. Yes, what you do for us will help me alleviate my situation, you know, it will make my life somewhat better but certainly not going to get me out of poverty. This is how far microcredit can take you, and we have to approach it in a balanced manner. And don't expect you know, it to solve all the problems of poverty in the world. You know, I think that realization will come, but it is a very important uh, you know, factor in terms of poverty elevation. You know, uh, there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about it.